now is Kerry Craig, global market strategist at JP Morgan Asset Management. Kerry, always good to have you with us. Despite uh, the raised uncertainty right now, you're still not expecting an outright recession. Why? Uh, good morning, Sherry. Well, there's not much in the economy to really signal that we'd see that amount of weakness to, to, that would lead to a recession. We still have very strong household uh, balance sheets. We have a strong corporate balance sheet. Uh, and we're still seeing decent momentum around the world in many economic indicators. And we still have parts of the world that are reopening from COVID. And so we think that, yes, while lower growth rates are certainly possible in the near term, uh, thinking about the case of a contraction in the economy over the next couple of quarters or this year, seems of a stretch at the moment, given everything else else that's happening. There are some headwinds, obviously, if we think about the inflation outlook, what that could do to dragging on consumer uh, and consumption more broadly. But we also have higher wages and things that are going to offset that. So we think about the balance of that being still one we would expect an economy that continues to expand rather than contract. Policy mistakes are one of the things that investors are really watching when it comes to markets here in the U.S. I wonder if that's also the case across Asia. We are now seeing Korea CPI at the highest since 2011. We're headed towards a BOK rate decision next week, as, of course, we have the RBA also deciding today. Yeah, absolutely. And across uh, emerging Asia, we've already seen central banks being hiking rates for some time now as they've looked to normalise that policy and the economies are behaving a little bit differently to what we've seen in developed markets. I think in terms of the RBA and the outlook for today, there's really what's driving that inflation higher at the moment. It is about the, the headline more than the core. We are seeing some broadening out of the inflation basket. But if we come back to what the RBA has really focused on, it's been realised inflation, which we have now, but also about realised wage growth, which we don't have. Uh, and I think that be willing to be a little more patient and wait for that to appear before they hike rates in the market, maybe getting a little bit ahead of itself, thinking about a May rate hike. So while we might see the language change in terms of opening up that flexibility, I still think those rate hikes might not come through until July or at least into the third quarter. What are the biggest risks when it comes to the growth outlook for Australia, given that a lot has changed in the three months, uh, in, in, in the period, I should say, when the RBA last met? I think some of the biggest growth risks would actually happen domestically if we saw uh, a large impact to household wealth through a collapse in the housing market, given the big run-up we have. And again, we didn't have that uh, deleveraging happening in the housing market here that we had in the US, which actually allows uh, for the, the uh, interest rates to rise. So curbing the wealth effects to curb spending in the economy would be a large one. Obviously, anything that would be negative towards China, there's a lot of positive in terms of what's happening in the commodity price space, given the expectations of fiscal spend in China and the benefits that that would have thinking about some of the sectors in Australia. Again, if that didn't materialise, that could be quite a, a strong hit to, to the growth outlook. But more broadly, I think that there is a case for saying Australia has been relatively insulated from what's happening around the world, given the geographical distance, but also given that we've sort of come out of the, the COVID lockdowns from the third quarter of last year and are still experiencing some of the benefit of that. If we look at the retail sales numbers, for example, which showed that consumption coming through. So what we do expect that the growth outlook here to moderate as that wanes off, it is, again, thinking about still pretty decent growth here in Australia uh, compared to the rest of the world. And again, I think that's probably being reflected in the outlook for interest rates and in terms of what the currency is doing as well. Where do you see opportunities across government debt at the moment? Because obviously with the big moves that we've seen in yields, there would be some opportunistic buying going on. I mean, from the outset, it would still be underweight duration uh, as a whole. We wouldn't be looking to add to government bonds. We still think there's scope for yields to rise a little bit here. Um, admittedly, the sharp move we've seen this year would pique many interests of investors who are thinking about, you know, maybe if you get 2.5% on a Treasury yield in the US, that's a time to think about putting that in your portfolio as a defensive hedge if you are thinking about a recession. Again, not our base case, so we think that yields can move higher. We wouldn't really want to be owning duration in this environment. If you were looking for perhaps thinking about the relative value, you might look to towards Europe relative to the US, where some of the pressures are going to be different. But I think a better position would actually be to look towards the credit markets, which have been relatively well behaved. Investment grade, for example, the spreads haven't really blown out there. And you are getting that defensive bias in your portfolio. And in the high yield sector, you've got default rates, which are at a fraction of a 1%. Uh, and the red, looking at the sort of positive outlook for the economy, uh, is still a case where you can pick up a bit of carry uh, compared to what you'd see in the government bond market.